Do you have any programs? No. You don't have any programs. Everybody should get one and a book map. Yeah. Make sure everybody gets the extra, you keep it and you give it out to family members and friends. This is the, um, everybody would sign this, relatives and friends from the next day. We'll take that. All right, then they waiting on many others? No. I don't want to start and you see a rushing on this thing. Yeah? No, no. Um, we call it to start at 2. Yeah. And if that is it, then you quit a while. No, if you have expect, if you are expecting 2 or 3 more. I have no appointments after this. And then right now, where do we go? Yeah. So it's all right, we could start. Yes. All right. <clears throat> well, let me extend to the members of the bereaved family and the extended family my sincere condolence on the passing of your loved one, Tono, Tono as we call him, and uh, <clears throat> so many names he had, alias names, 
We are so glad that you have responded amidst the heat of the day. You have observed that there's a change <coughs> in the officiant, the chair being Brother Gilbert Neptune. But I am, as you would see in front, Pastor Dennis, but here I put my surname, I'm Pastor Dennis Williams. <coughs> and I was a teacher for 40 years. So I would have taught at least two of Tono's children. <coughs> at the Princess Town Junior Secondary School, where I taught Spanish. <coughs> So, we start the service. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. He has also said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. How shall mourners be comforted? There are three basic ways. The highest of them all, the Holy Spirit, is the comforter. Secondly, they are comforted by God's word. And thirdly, they are comforted by you and me. It is said that in every desert of calamity, there's an oasis of comfort. You and I are such oases. How do we comfort each other? We follow the example of Jesus. When Mary and Martha, their brother Lazarus, died, Lazarus was the sole breadwinner of the family. And in John chapter 11, Jesus showed how he sympathized and comforted them. John 11, 35 said, Jesus wept. That's a comfort. You may sit with the mourners of the family. And there's a hush silence. Don't break it unless you could improve on it. If it is just to sit and offer your shoulder for them to lean upon and cry, you have done a good thing. Burden bearers, according to Galatians chapter 6. We are called to be burden bearer. So these words, and the body is here already, we thank God for your coming and your expression of sympathy. We invite Ricky Lane to do a prayer at this time. Thank you. Please bow with me in our word of prayer. Heavenly and merciful Father, Lord, we give all the life, creator of this world. Lord, we thank you for life, spirit, for health and strength. And for those gathered here and those listening and watching, Lord Father, as we honor and remember Sylvester Lee, my Father, Lord. Lord, I pray that we be well with his soul. You are the judge, not man. But I pray that you continue to look over us, to guide us, protect us. To carry us, Lord Father, when we tell ourselves we cannot go no further. You have promised us that, Lord, provided that we will be made obedient to you. Lord, I pray that everything that will be done here this day, Lord Father, will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. I pray that those grieving will be comforted. 
help each and up, each and every one of us to know. Your word has said and made reference to the number of days. And more so, Lord, help us to number our days. Teach us, Lord God, to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Continue to be with us. Continue to guide us and protect us. These things we ask in our name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ricky. Your prayer alone has indicated to me that you are a practicing Christian. Your prayer came from your heart, and that is important. We want to sing the old rugged cross. You'll find me changing the order of worship, right? I, I put the, the message of comfort way after the eulogy. So we want to sing, we want to sit and sing. The old rugged cross. Now you'll have to help me from my voice, I'll explain to you a little later what is happening with my voice. So I depend on your voice. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of losses. So I cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophy shall last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it some Very 
Gun. <coughs> Somebody will get a award from the students. You can tell them to go through there, tell the guy. Alright, not fool them, you know, this is the boys. If I read the Bible passage, let me explain to you why the voice is like that. In 2018, I was in New York and I fell sick. And when they took me to Queen's Hospital, they realized I had two ailments neck cancer and three clog arteries. And the treatment for the cancer was priority number one. Most people thought I would have died. <clears throat> and uh, the oncologist said to me, she doesn't know who I am, what I have been doing, and so on. She said, you must have done something good to get over this cancer. And after five, you know, who doesn't All right. After five chemo, she declared me cancer free. But I had to complete the, the radiation, which, which caused me, thank you, to end up with a dry throat and a walking stick. Well, I had a stick in the car. Right. So I always have to keep lubricate in the trunk. Not for water because that will get the horse. Normally it is hot coffee. So this is what happened. Right? Well, the clog arteries, they repair the arteries and so on by putting in three steps. I just came back last month after my fifth visit to them to monitor the situation. And uh, they told me I don't have to come back. I'm good. But I will always have to experience a dry throat. So this is why I ask you. You'll have to. And all I preach, you know, right now I'm in charge of the Tabland region of the Presbyterian Church. Paul, Tabland, Pity Cafe, St. Julia. So the choir, and when they don't have a choir, you know, the congregation have to do the singing. So you understand. <clears throat> I know God has some assignments for me to do still. So this is why I have to do it this way. So we have two readings. First reading. One verse of a psalm. Second reading, one verse from Paul's letter to the Romans. Let us hear the verse from the psalm. Psalm 130, verse 1. Out of the depths I cry unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. And let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. I read over that. Words of the psalmist David. Out of the depths, Psalm 130 verse 1. Out of the depths I cry unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And from Romans, 
Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. He said, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. I read over that. Romans chapter 8 verse 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. May God add his blessings to the reading, the hearing, and most of all the understanding of this portion of Holy Scriptures. And to his name be all honor and glory and praise. Amen. If I call the eulogist Ricky Lane to tell us something about the departed, is that if there is anybody who would want to sing maybe his favorite for us or to recite or to remind us of one of his the memories that he shared with us a famous saying a sound advice you know so if there's anyone who would like to say because you see the eulogy is the highest point of a funeral when the eulogy is read we ask nobody to speak after that except of course the message of God's word so if there's any one of you who would like to sing something or say something you see memories are museums of the mind the mind is a storehouse of knowledge the first time when I graduated from Bible school in 2002 they sent me in the river Miaro. In that region, there are five churches. Beach, Navet, Rio, Eccesville, Mafeke. And the first memorial service I had to do was for a man I never knew. I born and grew up in the river Miaro. But he left I think Pleasantville, or I think La Romina, not too sure. He left there and went up there after retirement. He was Presbyterian. And worshiping there at Rio Claro. He died after a month. So the people didn't know much of him. Well, that's for me. When I went to the house, I talked to the widow. She said, Pastor, well, well, I'll tell you, you're a nice man, I said, no, but nobody would want to say something beside you. She said, yes, we have two grandsons here. One 17 and one 15 plus, almost 16. And they're both writing eight. One in the final year and one finishing first year. I come like 11. That's what I meant. They say, Pastor, we, we write it out already. I go read one paragraph, and my brother go read the next paragraph. I say, very good. That was not the eulogy. That was not to say quoting from the eulogy. It is a memorial for 40 days. You know what those two boys said? And I will never forget that. Grandpa used to say, grandson, use your hands for production and not destructed. I remember that. That was in 2003. Eh? And I always quote that or refer to that when people can't remember what to say. A sound advice, you know. So is there anybody who would like to say something before I call on, on you again? All right, if there's none, we'll have to repeat at this time to offer the eulogy. If 
Yeah, I get everyone. I say the word we use today, a eulogy, a eulogist. I just, I just here to tell you a little bit about that. That's what I hear to do. <clears throat> Whatever word we use today to describe it, uh, so be it. Because in today's times, you know, we, we tend to adopt a lot of words to allow us to condone certain things in society. You know, so I just, and I know people might see the Bible, and I'm not, I'm not here to preach. The reason I come with this is because when Daddy died, the Bible was on Psalm 90. And if Daddy wanted me to talk here, he wanted me to talk just as he just talked. And Daddy, anybody talk to Daddy, he would talk to them about God. And it's not my place to read all these words and everybody listening to Psalm 90 I'm speaking about. And just two things I want to use from it. Psalm 90 verse 10 and Psalms 90 verse 12. Verse 10 reads, the days of our years are three score years and ten. <clears throat> and if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet did their strength live and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. And verse number 12 reads, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Not because it's my father, that he was a good man. That he lived good. <clears throat> One of the things, as the brother here was mentioning, that he will always ask me, how would this feel to get vexed? So that would have me thinking because you have to be wondering like this person to be a vexed. It's my father, yes. But the, the words, if the words resonate in your head, you will understand. So what vexation of the spirit does be like? Because I, I, I see that he put up with a lot of things. And if God could grant me to be close to that, is that good enough for me? Because I don't want to say he mastered that humility, but Daddy did real good when coming to that. Daddy was humble. Daddy loved his children. So much, Daddy, but that is one thing. Daddy will go out of his way for any one of his children that need help. Even up to when Daddy died, I think two of my siblings, he had well, well, by him and around him and things. He, he, he was always like that. He, the only thing Daddy wouldn't do is sell his food. I remember a lot of the things from home. Daddy would go to work, make sure we go to school, do what we had to do. I went going 84 to 89, Princeton Presbyterian before that, out of school. Um, starting at Cohen Hamilton, we had animals mining. We, lived, we grew up on Anza Street, Princeton. People who know it, uh, place the time on. we had animals mining there. Yeah. Then I come home from school, go and cut grass, come home. And you know, as a young person growing up, you might tell us your parents doing something wicked. Or your parents being unfair to you. But because of them things, I'm able to be here today. Because all that time, Daddy was showing us responsibility. We might be seeing it, or he probably didn't see it. But we just live and we just learn. He had an ex. This, this, this statement hit me a little hard when I was young. But that is one of the, the, the foundations that I, 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 I stand on. Daddy said, when a bird wants to have a young one, they build a nest. That was the point when I was just about phasing out and leaving home and you know, back and forth. And, and, I, and in a little bit it was like, like, like daddy running there. A little bit, I've been honest. It, it, was, it, it was in my head like that. But the words itself, when I keep playing over the words in my, in my head, it is just facts. It's real. It's the truth. Because if you go out there and you see a bird, two birds will go and they will build a nest, and they will have a young one, and then they, they, they will feed the young ones on them, and they will go up, they might teach them to fly teach them to feed, teach them to get food, and they would do, and they would do what they had to do, right? And you see these things that daddy say, I will never forget. Look at, look, look, look at, 
Look at how life is and how God is moving. Daddy, friends, and the people, he consider me a lot of things. And one just walk in the door, Mr. Lennox. See how God is work? So, all you know, I'm talking the truth here. Maybe somebody might be told you I'm able to say something bad about Daddy. I don't know him. I understand, but that side I might not know. Even when it comes to corporal punishment home, when Mommy was the real dean, I mean the dean, Mommy was the dean, it's not play anything with that, no running, no. And when she tell that, hey, you, you just run and half time, yeah, you need us fly from them. You need us fly from them. But Daddy really, you girl, you get some shocks, you know. You get some shocks, but Daddy doing it because he had to teach you too. But I still have to show that that level was, was even different the way he used to deal with things. <coughs> I didn't think I would have the strength to do I do you know. But from Sunday going, <coughs> some things were revealed to me that my father revealed to an individual. My father worked in the Shia works. And I didn't know this. And the person who told me they didn't hear it from daddy. So daddy would take me as a child, travel from Princess Town. He worked in Marak, Muruga. At some point in the road had a cable where so he stopped in the going over the cable and again the next taxi. And he would carry me to work with him. Leave me in the hands of friends or co-workers, wives or whoever, because he said like I like hand work. People just like what well, you know, that's how it was. And you see hearing these things that I didn't know. Beside God is what gave me the strength to be able to do what I'm doing today. I understand within myself and I feel from even some of the things that are still being revealed to me. I think I had quality time with my father. I might not be able to remember a lot of them when I was small. People would tell you they remember. I, I, I didn't even remember some of those things. As I get older and you're learning and you're developing, some of the things with me and your routine also start to change. Right? But just hearing these things show the level of care because in today's society, out of 10 people, 11 have their children in some kindergarten or some daycare or some kind of thing and why now the first thing we will say well we have we, we, we get so caught up in the secular world in this world that we live in and we forget the morals we forget how we have to live and these is the things that my father keep teaching to us over and over some of us get trouble and think you know, and let me let me say something none of the trouble or none of the wrong things that my father children do is to be on my father, you know. That is we own our God. Daddy didn't teach me nothing bad. He say you don't thief, you don't rob. All these things from small. My father have a tattoo on his hand. And as a little fella, Daddy always says to do ever in your life, take a tattoo. God will like that. Now that is something for you to think about and I said this person have it. This person have it. But they explain it here. Because you know why we always make mistakes. Nobody perfect. Nobody in perfect, but we could strive for that perfection to do what God asks us to do. Right? You see, Daddy and the siblings, Daddy, like all of them, and all in a different way. Because I'm not calling nobody them. He have a, he had different connections with some of them. Some real close, some little distant, but that is the individual Daddy would Daddy was. Daddy would sit down in the chair home, talk if he had to talk. He can most of the time he sit down watching Western movies. He loved us so much that. Daddy had Western novels when I was in the school. Western novels, you know. The one book I'm interested in reading right now is the Bible. I don't know if I read the next book. But the man reading Western novels. He liked that. He liked people. He liked life. He loved hunting. Daddy loved that. Everything. <clears throat> when you come in to responsibility, making yourself somebody to have a respect for people all these right things our parents taught us daddy always remain 
again, this is one of the main parts. That is why I mentioned first when Daddy died, his Bible was on Psalm 90. And you know, we go read the Bible over and over and over and say, and now we wouldn't really catch what it's saying. But it's right there in front of us. And all we have to do is to ask God to help you understand. That is all we have to do. Ask God to help you understand. Because a lot of times, as I say, I had experienced it. Sometimes your parents correct you and you, you, you tend to feel or be or want to, to tell you say you offended. Well then probably we should have been the parent. Then we will have seen what would have happened. We know the situation we're in right now with the pandemic and we have protocols to observe and all these other things. I could say Putting this aside, I don't know if we have find a place big enough for that, if you know. Correct, the, the, the man is a like man. You understand? And he just give people respect. He just show respect. He just talk. He just laugh. I, I, I think he just get a little upset and thing, eh? I'm being honest. But that vex will we just get vex? If I see that, you like that? See that term I use, Mr. Lennox? That will never change. Never, my father. These are the people I know. I could remember certain things about some of the people from me being small. And that is respect my father put forward to me. Always from small. Right? You could have the same age with me. Then my father friend is Mr. That is the amount of respect I give them. He didn't force us. Listen, when I went. 84 to 89, I had a school book for 300 and something dollars and, and Mr. Lennox don't know what kind of money we talking about back then. 84 to 89, a school book. I think I had one for 500 or plus dollars. And daddy worked in this ministry house, but he went all out. He went all out, all out for his children. He, he didn't skip a heartbeat when he had to do what he had to do. Daddy would want all of us to remember what he tell us. Nobody can force anybody to do anything he say or to live the style that he would have been forced to live. But at the end of the day, if we want to talk about respect and love and all the things that go with it, it could only go one way. It can go sideways, it can bend. It could only go one way. No. There are some people who play that and uh, are rolling daddy life. I have to and will mention some of them, Mr. Lennox being one, Miss Esther being one, Mr. Cyril, Kennedy. The, these people, it have a lot, it have plenty names. It have, it have plenty names. Right? And these, these people. I consider aunts and uncles <clears throat> because I was brought up under them and my father teaches listen, respect at the end of these are simple thing. You don't have to courage, you don't have to fight, you don't have to force. If God have a plan for any of us here, none of us could change it. And we don't know. Just as my the body, because my father not here, my father soul gone. You see, that body, that is what carry my father soul for his years on this earth. That is what we're going to put back into the earth now. So I'm not going to say, Daddy, I love you. No, no, Daddy can't hear me. That is Daddy body. I respect that. That is my father. And that is the person you'll be. And if you say, say, hey, we you talking so long by the time? He's a kind of jovial, that's the man. That is the man. Is that why some people keep him away from funeral and things? So he was making some kind of joke sometimes. But that is just him. I'm not here to prolong anything. Telling all you. I have my father built a relationship. Listen, eh? your God is working. Okay? And I've been on shortness and leave. Your God is working. Okay? God gave me a wife. 
that my father build a bond and relation that I cannot explain. Because we are, my mother died three years ago. And when mommy just died, we, we, we spent six months with daddy. And I only know this. Yesterday, my father called my wife and he said, oh, put your foot on my foot. Hold my hand and they dance. He said, when Ricky was small, I used to do that. And if I do him right, he used to vex and go in a corner by the door and hide. <laughs> you see that bond, what he built with you? God put her in place, somebody that he could be comfortable with and talk to and share it because my father tell my wife certain things that she could tell me and things that she cannot tell me and I will respect that till the day that I will never ask her to reveal that. That is his instructions. Right, so that, I say that to say this. The brother talk about comforting and support God first give them the strength and need, and then you see these memories watching the little video with the Ajani camera and thing. That changed my whole. <clears throat> that, that just changed me for over these few days. I tell me, I, because I wasn't sure if I'd be able to do this. But that is how it said that I would have this to bring that comfort to me in my time of grief. All my brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. Nobody can force all this to go in. But if any one of us have in our minds that we want to maintain, keep, and uplift the name that our father had and will still have, even though he's dead and gone, we know what we have to do. Nobody will have to come and tell me. Because we grew up in the house. Nobody, you have to come and tell me anything. And it is as simple as that. Daddy, daddy passed on. I think he's in a better place because from small, this is one thing that a man never leave us like. God, that man never, 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 ever, ever leave God aside. Right, so who know him, who love him, who understand him and who believe in the things he stands for, we have an example that we could use in our lives. We don't do everything, but we have different things we could use to help us because death smiles at everybody. All we could do is to smile back. And that is the truth, nothing else. Every single one of us here have a day. The only thing we don't know when, but you see that man up there? He know that. He already have that plan. Right? I want to say thanks to everybody. We know, it have, a, it have hundreds of people who want to come, who want to be here. Daddy never would have break the law and thing. Daddy like, the rules here, how it had to go. This is the law, well, this is how we have to do things, and this is how it will go. I want everyone to understand, to rem remember all the health protocols. We don't want nobody, you know, have to tell anybody anything. That is all, because all you know the man, and all you know what he would want and what he wouldn't want. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ricky. <clears throat> and I don't think there's anybody who could have said it as you have done. The hymn, I Come to the Garden Alone. Is it known? All right, so we sit and sing, and after which I will bring a message from God's Word. <clears throat> I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my head the Son of God is disclosing and he walks with Tells me I am his own. 
Psalm 19, verse 10 and 12, my favorite two verses for funerals and memorials and wake services. I didn't read it. I don't know for what divine intervention, and he quoted that so well. That is a psalm written by Moses. And to add what Ricky has said from its biblical meaning, 70 years is what Moses was evaluating should be the average span of life. 80, but with some pain. He realized the brevity of life, how short a life could be. So he said, Lord, teach us the number of our days and give us this heart of wisdom. When Tono and I, Mr. Lang down, I was sleep down there by the boy with the red farmer and so on. Many, many years ago. That time the late Daniela used to come to school by us and so on. And he always reminded me. He said, teacher, I remember you were one year older than me, you know. I was born in 49 and he born in 1950. And we always used to have solid conversation. You were not a man to waste words and so on. I really the right to remind you that. Teach us the number of days. Because to reach up to 80, the psalmist recognized, in Moses, that is, that we could suffer with terminal illnesses, like cancer and so on, that, you know. I was 68 when I got well diagnosed with cancer. 
and July last when I when I celebrated seventy-two. When I say celebrating, when I observed, I said, Lord, when you have allowed me to cross the seventy, and I will recognize now that you have to give me a heart of wisdom. So if I make eighty, I know it with some tragic experiences and so on. But that's the time, you know, you suffer from terminal illnesses, you get stroke, you have amputation, you know, and so on. Right not too far from where he lived, John. John Mommy, we buried him on Saturday, he was 87. No, 84. Harry will be 87 children, right? And we recognize what Moses really meant. Because John became deaf, he could not have heard. He would just walk on the road and so on. Everybody would recognize, you know, the minute you cross 70, what is happening. But Moses said, Lord, you know, whether 20, 30, 40, give us this heart of wisdom that Ricky has mentioned the seriousness of the discipline with which he was brought up and his siblings as well. That is part of the legacy. That is the part of wisdom. He said, you read the book and ask God to help you unfold the meaning. Excellent. That is the part of wisdom we need to inculcate in ourselves. Just a brief thing about wisdom. Two things I want to say. Wisdom, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Not that God is a big lion or tiger sitting somewhere there, want to jump down and devour us if we do something wrong. God is a forgiving God. It's a reverential fear. A holy fear. If I do you something wrong, lower down the road, it will be plowed back to me, my child or my grandchild. God said, vengeance is mine. We leave it to him. That is the kind of reverential fear we have. Wisdom. Wisdom is knowing when to speak your mind and also when to mind your speech. Because sometimes it's not what we say that matters, but how we say it. Look at the kind of murder rate in our country. And most of the time is because of what we say and how we say it aggravates other people. Sometimes because of envy, you know, and other things like that. Wisdom, one more thing about it. Now that <clears throat> Tono has gone, right, we will commit his body to the grave just now. But the soul has gone back to God. In the old version of the Bible, in the book of Wisdom, chapter 3, it says, the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God. St. Paul said to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. But St. Paul also said we don't enter heaven just like that, you know. This body is perishable. It will have to put on an imperishable body on judgment day. This is a physical body, it will put on a spiritual body. This is mortal flesh, subject to death. We shall put on an immortal body. And then when we are judged, we will hear that voice saying, Well done, Tono, come. Enjoy heaven that is prepared for you. See, heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. We just don't live carelessly. All right, when I dead, I'm going to heaven. 
We have to prepare for that. That is the wisdom we have to get while we are alive. And we ask God for it. Finally, about wisdom. You are called to make a decision where family matters are concerned. When the Joker Ricky, you come, or Mr. Lennox, you come, talk, talk to us because this one behaving bad and just quoting, you know. And before you say anything, you tell yourself, why they select me, boy? Because they saw in your wisdom that Moses prayed for. Give us this heart of wisdom, but help us to apply it as well. So you talk to God. Father, if what I'm going to say is going to hurt, let me not say it. If what I'm going to do is going to cause friction and fragmentation within the bubbles of family life, let me not do it. However, Lord, if what I'm going to say and what I'm going to do is going to edify, is going to build, is going to create a bond of love and friendship is going to cause a revival. Let me say that very really quickly. That is wisdom. So let me just take a few minutes now to share the message I have with you for today. So thank you, Ricky, for selecting those two verses. They are really precious verses to me and to all of us. I want to bring a short message from God's word. Let us ask his blessings on it. Father, as we are about to break the bread of life, as we are about to plunge into deep meditation on your word, help us, O oh Father, through the power of your Holy Spirit, teacher and guide, come near and teach us as to what to say, so that the words from my lips and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I want to deal with a question today. How do you respond when death strikes? How do you respond when death strikes? And there are some <clears throat> six answers given. Let me say you take a minute each. Firstly, when death strikes, you communicate. You get in touch. The neighbors, first of all, you know your neighbors and your closest relative? Yeah. And Jesus was very concerned about neighboring relationships. Love your neighbor and yourself. He used a good Samaritan to illustrate who is my neighbor. My neighbor is the person who needs my help. So you call out your next door neighbor, hey, daddy just passed You communicate. You see, pain is inevitable. You can't stop pain from coming. But you see, suffering with, a, with age is manageable. You can manage suffering. Another thing about communication. There's a writer by the name of Dorothy Sayers. She said, joy shared is joy double, and sorrow shared is sorrow half. Half your pain is gone, and you share your sorrow. Ventilate it. Let it come out. Pour it out. You communicate. He also recognized that when you communicate, we who are recipients of the news, two things we must do. One, you have empathy and sympathy. We empathize. We feel how the bereaved family is feeling. You walk in their boots, so to speak. If 
I will in that position, I'm talking as a neighbor, as a friend, as a relative, as a recipient of the news, what would I want the, them to do to me? Let me now do it to them. And what you do as a result of empathy is sympathy. A neighbor down by me, five houses down, circular street, that's hospital street, passed away because of COVID. He died at the Point Hospital. So, he has his wife, he has one child. The boy is about 33 years. So I told the wife, my wife, my, I have three children. <coughs> three children, my wife and myself. I said, come on, there's a poor case. Let us see what we can do. So I started with a $200. I said, collect from the other, the real working man. So she, my son and I, she said, we're going down to the way. We went down to the way by the house. Because he died by the hospital. And right down the hill. So I called him one side, I write out a sympathy card and so on. So when I went there, I, said, I saw him and his wife. I said, come, let me go in that room. They have no children. I said, see this? <coughs> it's to help you with your funeral expenses and so on. Because now it's about all kinds of 20 dollars you want him to do. Cremation. Once you die from COVID and so on. All right. So. He said, I'll go in and say, okay, now. See, when he nearly fell down, he said, I crashed to him. He said, no, but he, hey, he was anything that he had. Well, we give him $1,000 to be honest. You communicate somehow. So when death strikes, you communicate. What is hard to part with today, tomorrow it will be sweet to remember. Secondly, when death strikes, you pray about it. As Ricky emphasized, the value of prayer. Let me just share two out of the six points I have on prayer. I'm not going to do all that. Just two. One, prayer is talking to God on a one-to-one. -one. Jesus gave us a divine prescription. Ask for whatever you need in my name, and my heavenly Father will grant you. John chapter 15. That's a divine prescription. Ask for what you need, not what you wanted. Some of us still want to win the lotto and so on. But we need the health and the strength and the guidance that Ricky spoke about. This is what we need. Freedom from sickness and, you know, you name it. And about prayer again. Matthew 6 verse 6 tells us, And when you want to pray, that when the disciples say, Lord, he tell them, oh, they must pray. But we don't know how to pray. Why don't you teach us how to pray? So before he taught them the Lord's Prayer, he said in Matthew 6, verse 6, when you want to pray, go to your room, shut the door behind you, and your Father who sees you in secret will reward you openly. Go to death. He will hear your prayer. He know what are your needs. When I say you, I mean all of us. He know what are our needs. And Jesus was telling them the secret of prayer is to pray in secret. One more thing about prayer I want to share with you. I told you I taught Spanish, you know. I taught that for 40 years. There's a Spanish quotation that says, La oración es el volante por supuesto, no la rueda en repuesto. Prayer is the steering wheel, of course, not the spare tire. It is an integral part of life. It is what propels the Christian. 
what keeps us navigating through this troubled world, we got to pray. So in that track, you communicate, you pray. Thirdly, keep the faith. What is faith? Hebrews 11 verse 1 tells us faith is the substance of things who walk the evidence of things, the evidence of things not seen. It ain't happened yet. It's going to happen. Don't give up. Winners don't quit. Quitters don't win. Trust God. That's a simpler word for faith. Trust. Trust God. When the oncologist in, at Queen's Hospital in New York told me, you have two things in your favor, Mr. Stan. Say, why is that, Doc? She said, he cancer cells are cross here. And it is treatable and curable. I said, we go for it. She said, you must have done something good to get over this cancer. Keep the faith. Trust God. You see, what Ricky was emphasizing, you're reading God's word. You have to be a believer if you want to be an achiever. Trust him. Trust the doctor. Trust mommy. Trust daddy. They won't misguide you in life. Keep the faith. And there are wonderful, victorious examples of faith in the Bible, which we don't have to go through all now. Blind Matthias. The woman with the issue of blood. Look at. They did not give up. Especially blind materials. Begging. A beggar. He heard Jesus coming down there and say, Aha, fall on here. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Mark chapter 10, verses. 42 to 50 or 46 to 50 yeah Jesus stopped he heard the cry but didn't say anything the disciples went and said why don't you shut your mouth Jesus have a busy schedule he had time for no blind man today the Bible says he shouted even more loudly son of David have mercy on me Jesus said bring him The same people who tried to shut him up had to go now and say, get up, he's calling you. What did the Bible say? He jumped up, laughed heartily, threw up his cloak, and they brought him to Jesus. You know, you know, how oh, it is said in the in the Bible written in Spanish. Say salto, he jumped up, se quito el abrigo. He threw up his overcoat. Se rio a carcajadas. He laughed heartily. He le trajeron a Jesucristo. And they brought him to Jesus. More importantly, Jesus asked him, which is you want me to do for you? He on a house, he on a life. No love, Judy. Lord, I want to see. I want to see again, which means he did not, he was not born blind, you know. Blindness was incidental. Looking at the faith of him, Jesus said, go ahead, man. Your faith has made you well. And instantly he was able to see. And as a token of gratitude, he followed Jesus on his way. Keep the faith. When that strike, you communicate. You pray. You keep the faith. Fourthly, you keep the peace. Easy to say, hey, peace, brother. Peace. It must come from the heart. Not only from the lips. There is where peace comes from. Inside there. The Hindu says Shanti. The Pandit knows what he says when he says Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Chanting the name of God, which is peace. The Muslims say when they greet each other, Assalamu alaikum. And they return that blessing of peace, Wa alaikum salam. Salam is peace. In Arabic, and to the Christian, Shalom, Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. But, but Shalom has two meanings in Hebrew peace, and also it's an infinitive to live kindly. So if you find yourself living kindly, starting from the home, and it must flourish on the outside, you'll have the peace of God.
And then, fifthly, reflect on the life of the departed. What Ricky again was saying, he will always remember the words of advice of his dad, the encouragement, and he would not force his wife to tell him what his dad told her. That is the wisdom that Moses prayed for. Yes, he talked about hard work that don't kill, provision to family needs. However, look how expensive the book was. In my days of growing up, the most expensive book I could remember my father would have paid for was about $20, which was hard to find. And that was from 1962 to 66, high school days. He supplied us and our 12 children, 12 of us. I went to school be put all my primary school life. Only high school I'll be a get a little crap soul to put on. Those days had no water and electricity of my view where I was born. Study with flammo and kerosene light and so on. Must in firewood to cook. Carrot house. We had the luxury. We had to work hard. That was all right. That didn't kill. But poverty must be a blessing in disguise. You must use that as a springboard to grow and develop. If you feel a sense of depravity, don't stop there. Failure is not final unless you stop trying. And you won't shoot a fella for making an effort. No. Encourage him. Motivate him. When Joshua took over from Moses, he found a depleted and, and, and um, demotivated army. And he said to them, in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 or 9, Be strong and of good courage, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So we hold on to that. When you reflect on the legacy of examples that your dad would have left for you. Kind word. You know, you name it, all what Ricky would have told you. And from what I remember of him, he never got discouraged with any of his children. No matter how Daniela was behaving, he never gave up. He used to talk to me. We talked to her, we talked to her, as many of them as we could. And in society, not only his family. So we reflect on the departed. And there's a wonderful quotation about, that I could use, that will epitomize, you know, the life of Tono. What the clock says, consider him as the big clock in the family, in that little portion of society where he lived, in the workplace and so on. What the clock says, an anonymous writer wrote that. Hear what the clock says. I serve thee here with all my might to tell the hours by day and night. Therefore, example, take from me to serve thy God as I serve thee. And finally, when you reflect on his life, take a page from his book and put it into practice. Emulate his examples. Yes, so finally is when death strike. You know, you communicate, you pray, keep the faith, keep the peace, reflect on his life, and read your holy book. You see the book that Ricky picked up? It contains the word of God. Read it to be wise and practice it to be holy. B-I-B-L-E, basic instruction before leaving earth. Who should read the Bible? Young people to know how to live. Who should read the Bible? Old people to know how to die. Yes, it gives us the assurance of where we are going after death. So in closing, let me say it, Tono, your memory is our keepsake with which you will never part. God has you in his keeping, but we have you in your heart.
In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We sing in the street by and by as we bring our service to our close. And we continue at the Dabeb Cemetery. And the service will continue, but not for long. Just to do the committal. We want to stand and sing. All the time we were sitting, let us stand and sing in the street by and by. You help me with the voice again. There's a land that is fairer than this, and by feet we can sit afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place. Yeah. Everybody. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. We shall sing on the The melody, a shout of the blessed, and the spirit shall sorrow no more. Not a sigh for the blessing of rest. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore to a bountiful Father above. We will offer our tribute of praise for the glorious gift of His. And the blessing that follows is in the sweet by and by. We, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet, oh, in the sweet by and by. Let us pray. Father God, dismiss us with your richest blessings at this time. As we make our way to the Nabat Cemetery, Father, grant us your traveling mercies, where we will do the committal of our dearly departed Father and loved one. And now may the grace of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Continue to rest, remain, and abide with all of us here in Princess Town, and with all God's children everywhere, both now and forevermore. And all God's children say, Amen, Amen, and Amen. God bless you. So we'll be taking our leave to go to the Labet Cemetery for the committal. So we hand over to the undertakers, you inform them.
ಹೇಳ್ಬೋದು